why Antony Caro, Stainless Steel, when there are five other volumes? The five other volumes deal with what we thought was every aspect of Caro's work when we started the project, when uh, Tony Caro was still very much alive and participating in the project. So we dealt with his small-scale sculpture. We dealt with his early work. Uh, we dealt with the work that he made in a wide variety of materials. Uh, I wrote a piece on his uh, work, uh, particularly towards the end of his life, when he was fascinated by the possibility of sculpture that was about the interior, uh, some of which you actually had to enter in order to fully understand what was going on. And another volume was about his linear abstract sculpture. But somewhere after uh, Caro's death, he died at the end of uh, 2013, a month short of his 90th birthday. Uh, we all thought he would last a lot longer. His mother was 100 and something, and we were counting on that. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. But after he died, we realized there was one aspect of his work that really hadn't been looked at as a coherent body. And that was his work in stainless steel, which he used throughout his mature career. One thinks of him, of course, as a sculptor in mild steel, in just regular steel. Um, this is a corner of the Camden Town Studio, uh, which is uh, looking more tidy in this photograph than I actually ever remember it. But there certainly was this stockpile um, against the wall. And outside it, in one of the parking places, uh, was an even larger pile. And this was an accumulation over, I don't know how many decades, which he would walk by every day on his way. The, from the one, there was a, another building uh, that was part of the compound uh, where one had tea and lunch, and uh, his painter wife's studio was upstairs. The office was in another small building. So he was going back and forth all the time. And I remember one occasion when we walked from the studio to, the, to have tea, and he suddenly, at that point he was using a cane, um, jabbed at a piece of steel that he must have walked by a thousand times in the last 10 years, and started yelling for his assistant, Patrick Cunningham, who was the gentleman in the white sweater, and saying, Pat, Pat, I know what I want to do with this now. And that was, was typical, this, this responsiveness to material. Uh, Caro had, the end of his life, was working like this. This was made in 2013, one of the last sculptures he made. Um, I put the measurements in because you don't really get a sense of the scale of the photographs. It's a very, very large piece. And uh, as you can see, it's made of multiple materials. And it has this peculiar quality of being an enclosure that at the same time is something that you can see through. Uh, this was something that um, was a kind of obsession the last years of Caro's life. He had made sculptures that, as I say, were all about the interior. Uh, some of them were complete enclosures. You could kind of peer over the top, or you could imagine what was inside. Um, others could be physically penetrated. There were large ziggurat-like things that you walked through, and your, your pace was somehow dictated by it. You found yourself walking in a very ceremonial manner. But then he said, what, could you make a sculpture that was all exterior? And he wasn't quite sure what that meant. But it translated into these perspex and steel pieces. It's not what you associate with him. This is what made his reputation. Uh, this wonderful piece, um, which belongs to the Tate, 
and is uh, hardly um, transparent. As you, you walk the length of it, um, as you move around it, things kind of disappear. They become all edge. It's an iconic Caro piece. And this, this kind of hovering, gravity-defying, very linear sculpture is, as I say, <coughs> what made his reputation. And it's steel. He began to work in steel, in mild steel, after his first trip to America in 1959. Before that, he'd been making expressionist modeled figures uh, with uh, titles like Man Taking Off a Shirt, uh, it's a, someone struggling to get up after lying down. Uh, there was a woman taking off a girdle. Uh, you wouldn't think you could make a sculpture of that, but it was pretty terrific. Um, and they were winning him a lot of attention. He was seen as the kind of white hope of British sculpture after uh, Henry Moore, uh, with whom he had worked. He literally went and knocked on Moore's door uh, after uh, graduating from the Royal Academy schools because he decided that Moore was making the most interesting sculpture in England. And the Royal Academy schools was extremely conservative. So his time with Moore was very important because it really introduced him to all kinds of things he'd never been exposed to, uh, like uh, pre-Columbian sculpture and Cubist sculpture. But Moore, uh, uh, Caro was still making figurative expressionist work. He was very dissatisfied with it. He said he didn't want to make imitation human beings and the figure was getting in his way. But he didn't know what to do about it. Went to America on, for the first time on a fellowship, met a lot of abstract artists, Kenneth Noland, Helen Frankenthaler, Robert Motherwell, Adolf Gottlieb. He met David Smith. He didn't have a chance to go up to Bolton Landing, but he did see one Smith sculpture, a painted steel sentinel. But they had a conversation that lasted all night. Carr wasn't sure what he thought about all this work he was seeing. Um, he had been introduced to it by Clement Greenberg, who had been to his studio in England and hadn't liked his work at all. Uh, that didn't stop Carr from getting in touch with him in New York. But even though he wasn't sure what he thought about this work, he was enormously excited by the energy and the lack of inhibition and the daring of these Americans. And Greenberg said something to him as he left, which was, if you want to change your work, change your habits. Well, Caro interpreted this as, stop making the kind of thing you've been making that you don't like anyway. Stop using all the materials you know how to use. Stop modeling. Why don't you try working in steel? Which he had no idea how to use. So he had a load of scrap steel delivered uh, to what was then his studio, which was the garage of the converted stable that he and his wife lived in, in Hampstead. His neighbors were not pleased about this. And he started making what eventually became this kind of sculpture. When he first showed it, it was uh, seen as extraordinary and established his reputation. He continued to work in steel his entire life. Uh, there were times when he had the, uh, an opportunity to work at steel mills and use enormous slabs. Uh, he, was, he would find uh, what's called uh, cobble, which is what happens when something goes wrong in a rolling mill and the, the uh, strip of steel uh, flips back and sticks to itself. Steel mills don't like admitting they have it, but sculptors love it. Uh, crop, the soft edges, you know, when you roll steel, it's like pasta. It has soft edges. Doesn't like going through the rolling mill, it squeezes out. Cut off those soft edges. And uh, he had this stock of all sorts of pieces. So here he is, 
in 2012 working on one of his last series, the Park Avenue pieces. You see one in the background. And this is an enormous uh, mild steel sculpture, uh, one of the most powerful series uh, that he ever made. You see another uh, stack in work on the right. So this was continuing. He never lost his appetite for this. He also worked in clay as a mature artist, which is something he hadn't done since he was a student. Um, he worked in bronze, but he invented a whole other way of making bronze, where he had pre-cast pieces that he then used the way he used steel. He worked in silver. Uh, he would incorporate uh, found objects. He made some pieces that were out of uh, maritime bollards, uh, pieces of cast iron stoves, uh, which he would completely transform and by virtue of how they were placed, uh, become something completely other. But this is what one associates with Caro, polychrome steel sculpture. He was playing with transparency, just as he was at the very end of his life with this expanded metal mesh. Um, as you know, when you move around these expanded metal mesh pieces, uh, the mesh sort of seems to open and close. It becomes an opaque plane, then you could see through it. So you can see there are these ongoing obsessions. But what has this got to do with stainless steel? Well, after David Smith died in an automobile accident in May of 1965, Caro inherited a large amount of steel that came from Smith's stock. Uh, Smith was very friendly with Noland. Uh, Caro had become very friendly with both of them when he was an artist and resident at Bennington College between 63 and 65. Jules Olitsky was teaching there as well. Helen Frankenthaler and Robert Motherwell visited often. It was this extraordinary hotbed of serious, ambitious, abstract art. And the, one can only imagine the intensity of the conversations that they were all looking at each other's work and arguing and drinking a lot and having a whale of a time. Uh, Caro was there, when, as was Noland, as was Olitsky, when Smith had his fatal accident. Um, so this was, he was very much part of the Smith legacy. And he must have been extremely grateful to receive all of this very, very high quality steel. But he also found it very inhibiting for a number of reasons. Uh, these are Smith's last sculptures, uh, the last series, the so-called cubi, which were made of stainless steel. And he was very interested in the fact that stainless would reflect the color of the surroundings. It was a way of getting color into sculpture without painting it, without having a skin. They were the sculptures that Smith is still probably best known for. And at the time of his death in 65 and for the decade after that, they were definitely the work that was most familiar. Uh, museums decided, ah, yes, we've ignored this man all this time, but this is what contemporary sculpture is supposed to look like. So they were beginning to collect these works. And between something like uh, Smith's death and the following decade, uh, just about every major museum in the United States acquired one of these. So they were very well known. These volumetric, geometric boxes with this burnished surface. The burnished surface was, Smith always said, purely expedient. It was grinding to get rid of the marks that resulted from the welding and the making. But he must have also liked the way it treated the light because one of his, as I say, obsessions was this notion of uh, capturing the surroundings and having color coming from the surroundings rather than a painted skin, although he had 
polychromed any number of sculptures, as you know, during his lifetime. His ambition, he said, was to combine painting and sculpture into a new art form that would beat either one. So here is Caro with this pile of pre-cut steel. Why pre-cut? Because in the 60s, there was no such thing as a domestic size plasma cutter. You could only cut stainless steel in a factory with a big shear. Um, it was totally unresponsive in normal materials that a sculptor in steel would have in his studio. Smith could weld stainless steel. He'd taken a special course, as a matter of fact, when he was doing his war work during World War II, welding armor plate onto locomotives in Schenectady. We found the certificate. He was a crack welder, and he, but he, even he had to take this special course. But he couldn't cut it. So all of these were preconceived, uh, mostly in liquor boxes, and the pieces pre-cut and sent to him, which he would then uh, assemble these pieces into these geometric volumes, for which, as I say, he was inextricably uh, uh, associated. One of the things that Caro loved about mild steel was how responsive it was, how directly you could work. Uh, it, could, it was so easy to work. Not that he ever learned to weld properly, but uh, Patrick Cunningham, who you saw in, that, uh, in those photographs, was his assistant for most of his life. And before that, there was somebody else. But those were people who really knew how to weld. Uh, Tony's idea of welding was to hold the rod, hold the torch, shut his eyes, and hope. <laughs> so it was very fortunate that he had good people working for him, uh, for all the rest of us, too. Um, but you know, you, working, and those of you who've, who've ever done this know what I'm talking about. Um, working with steel, uh, mild steel, can be as direct as drawing. Tack welding is as spontaneous as drawing. Tack welds can be broken, things can be repositioned, things can be cut, readjusted, and this was the way Caro worked, absolutely spontaneously, always full size, no prep preparatory drawings, no preconception. The antithesis of how Smith was making these. So what was he going to do with this stuff? Well, the first pieces that he made were in 1966. And we don't really know how he got this steel, uh, this stainless. It clearly came from Smith's stock. But he didn't officially inherit it until 1967. Uh, Clement Greenberg was one of the trustees of the Smith estate. And probably had access. That's all we know. Um, but you can see from this and from another piece made at the same time what Caro is doing. He is systematically unsmithing these pieces of steel. He is taking away the associations with verticality, with volume, extending horizontally, not putting these plates in, constructing a volume with these plates, but allowing each one to exist independently and extend outwardly. Now, there, this is polished. It doesn't have the, quite the grinding pattern of the um, Smith pieces. And that was a problem, because he didn't want this to look like Smith in any way. They say these were the first uh, pieces he made. We not quite sure um, how he got the steel. Uh, Greenberg was probably the uh, person who intervened. But after 67, he is using this material in increasingly audacious and inventive ways. And even when he's approximating a volume, it's a very, very different kind of volume. It's not elevated. It's lying on the ground. Um, it's open. It seems to be 
unfolding itself. If you know Smith's sculpture well, you start recognizing, oh, I know those triangles. Um, but it's not assembled in any way that resembles anything cre that existed. It took Caro a long time to start using the steel that he inherited in 67. The 70s are the, about the first time he starts using it because Smith was killed in his pickup truck. A load of steel was in the truck. And every time, uh, Caro said, every time he picked up a piece, he wondered, is this the piece that killed David? So there was this enormous inhibition of the terrible accident that had happened to a friend while, while he was there. I mean, they, they were all on their way to Nolan's house when this accident happened. Uh, Smith wouldn't let anyone drive with him. Uh, they were all in the hospital in Albany when he died. So it was not hearing about it, it was direct. And then there was the additional, as I say, the, the legacy of this very, very well-known body of work, um, which was so distinctive and so beginning to be so widespread um, in terms of uh, Smith's rep yep, reputation. So there's this constant um, conscious effort, I, I think, to make sure that nothing looks like any of the cubi. Part of it is scale. These, these are not only horizontal, they tend to be fairly small because instead of stacking big volumes, he is using these pieces independently and of course adding other things along the way. The polishing, uh, you have to do something. I mean, this gets to be quite marked up uh, because of the welding, because of working on it. So you have to do something to restore the surface. And uh, this was one of the things that happened. But he very quickly decided that, no, I want something other. So this, which is a relatively vertical piece, um, includes a stainless tank end, which uh, would have been used in, in a vertical position, probably, uh, for one of the cubi. And these deconstructed pieces, it has been, uh, the surface has been matted down and the relationship of this big disc to the framing of the sculpture is almost like one of the cubi turned inside out. You know, where you expect it to be solid, it's planar. Uh, where you expect to see um, a, a solid form, there's an implication that you can see into it. And by this time, I think, say, uh, Caro is more comfortable with the steel. He is. Uh, using it in ways that seem totally related to his own work. Uh, there's a series of 60s pieces which use tank ends, which are polychromed, where he's using them in a slightly different way. So, it's, oh yeah, I know how to use that. I've, I've had one of those before. And you start seeing some rather um, witty and audacious challenges. Um, sorry about the size relationship here. I couldn't find a smaller version of Checker or a larger version of Candida. Um, and why the, that photograph cuts the base off of Candida, I don't know. You have to imagine that there's a horizontal plane. But this is one of the last sculptures. It's enormous, as you see. And it is these flat, overlapping plates. I think it really comes out of a brat collage that belongs to the Museum of Modern Art that, that Smith knew very well. But it certainly is of a scale that is heroic and monumental, and it's, it, I think, one of his greatest pieces. Uh, should you find yourself in Yorkshire uh, for in the fall, uh, this is part of a big uh, stay, uh, David Smith show at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park and it's up on top of a hill, and it looks fabulous. It looks almost as good as it does here in Bowdoin Landing. The confrontational quality of the, and the graphic quality of Candida is very different than what you've seen with anything of Caro. I mean, the, uh, 
early one morning, which is so linear and delicate, but is really defining three-dimensional space. Uh, what's very important here are the overlaps. You know, what's in front of what? What touches what? The very, very delicate, which is always true of Smith's sculpture. Caro's small piece, made with Smith's steel, uh, sort of takes off from this. He certainly knew this piece. He wasn't looking at it when he made it, but he, had, he was certainly aware of it. And it's as though he said, all right, well, I'm going to take this idea and I'm going to deconstruct it. I'm going to take the pieces and I'm going to put them back together in a way that has nothing to do with the way Smith did. And that seems to be the ongoing thread in all of these pieces. Uh, it's taking something from an artist he admired and finding a new way of dealing with it that is his own. If you, as I say, if you know the cubi, you might recognize the component parts. But the way these have been put together, the way they expand across the floor, uh, the way curving elements have been introduced, uh, we're dealing with another language, another vocabulary. Caro didn't work exclusively in stainless during this time. He was working in mild steel. He was making much larger pieces. He was making polychrome pieces at the same time. But he continued to have this relationship with this not only particular material, which he found fascinating, but with this legacy. The biggest difference is obviously the horizontality and the dissection. Uh, the, this is a bit, quite a long piece, as you can see. And it just stretches out in front of us like a reclining figure. As we move around it, uh, many of Caro's have, uh, sculptures have this quality. You keep thinking, if I just move around a little bit more, I'll get a view that will tell me everything. You never do. He constantly keeps you moving around. Uh, that was something he said he admired very, very much in Donatello's sculpture the notion that you were constantly invited uh, to find another viewpoint, even though there were clear viewpoints from each angle. Uh, he was much less interested in Bernini uh, with a spiraling movement. I think it was the uh, moments of stasis in Donatello that interested him so much. Uh, you know, this is clearly a viewpoint that is complete but I might learn something if I moved. And I think that's the quality that he admired in Donatello so much. It was actually rather unusual for Cara to talk about another sculptor in relation to his own sculpture making. Because <clears throat> mostly he was looking at paintings. And there is a whole series of sculptures that are based on his recollections of paintings that he admired, not sculptures. He said he very often would look to painting for ideas about how to, fig how to finish sculpture. He did at one time make a series of paintings in Helen Frankenthaler's studio. Uh, Frankenthaler had made a series of very good sculptures in Caro's studio, and then they exchanged the visit. Uh, I think I'm one of the few people who's actually seen those paintings. I don't think they exist anymore, and it's probably a very good thing. <laughs> he was definitely someone who thought in three dimensions. Um, the Frankenthalers were terrific. They were shown a few years ago as a group at, at, before Nodler closed. Horizontality, of course, is something that one associates with Caro. And, uh, works like Prairie, um, in which no matter how much you realize that those rods are actually being supported in critical places, you know, it's, it's like flying buttresses. You may know intellectually that their job is to transfer weight downward, but they always look like they're springing upward. And Prairie is one of the uh, iconic works of uh, dealing with this quality of levitation 
that is so characteristic of early Caro. Uh, the sense that there's a surrogate horizon above the ground and that things are related to it and do not weigh heavily upon the ground. Which is really fascinating because when Caro was making the expressionist figures, uh, the man lighting the cigarette, the man uh, struggling to lift himself up. He said they were about what it was like to be inside the body. And being inside the body was clearly an experience of being oppressed by gravity. And yet, as soon as he switched to steel, which is clearly a very heavy material, it became weightless. I think you still do experience these sculptures kinetically. I think as you move around them, you have a sense that you are uh, stretching, that you are, you're feeling what it is like to, to reach across the space. But it's not the same as struggling against gravity. Horizontality persists. And so you have a work like this as you can see, extremely horizontal. And he has solved the problem of steel looking like, the stainless steel looking like something that David Smith used. This sculpture also includes some mild steel, so you could argue, well, this is a way of homogenizing these two different kinds of material and unifying them. It also accentuates the sense of weightlessness, which you get from the light reflective properties of stainless steel, but it does have some of those associations. You have a connection between the uh, regular sculpture, the, or the mild steel sculpture that he was making that had made his reputation that was polychromed. So that's one solution. Don't want it to look like Smith? Paint it a color that reminds you of Caro. Uh, pay attention to that diamond shape in the foreground. I'm sure you recognize some of those triangles. They have turned up in other things. Color became a very important part of what Caro was thinking about in relation to stainless steel once he started painting it. And in fact, these works and a number of others are a collaboration with Kenneth Noland. Uh, Caro, as I say, had been artist in residence at Bennington in Vermont between 63 and 65, went back to London, but he would come periodically and work in Noland's studio uh, using often uh, the Smith stainless, which much of which had remained in Nolan's studio. And these are two, um, I'm sorry about the camera angle on the one on the right. Um, it belongs to an artist, and that was the photograph she sent us. We didn't want something quite so arty, but, but it gives you a sense of the way Nolan was using color to transform the actual uh, physical structure of these paintings and it, of these sculptures. And it became a, a very interesting conversation between the two of them. The uh, one on the right uh, is uh, uh, stands on a, a base, um, it's a table piece. The one on the right you're looking down on, um, so it kind of distorts it, but you get the idea. The monochrome is something that Caro did very often. And as you see in drift, it is unifying these very disparate parts. But he also used those same parts, those diamond shapes, in this extraordinary piece, um, which belongs to the uh, Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And, uh, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts doesn't seem to show it very much. But I was lucky enough to live with this because it was on loan to a museum I worked for, and I know how good it is. 
Those diamond-shaped pieces are, I think, quite fascinating. They hover, they stretch, they float. They're definitely David Smith's, but they're pieces that David Smith had made for himself that he never got around to using. The photograph on the left is of a, an outdoor workspace at Smith's Bolton Land in Studio. And that is a still from a film that was made by the sculptor Robert Murray uh, shortly after Smith died. He went up and recorded everything that was at Bolton Landing, including the material that was lying out there. So here was material that had the imprimatur of Smith, but was not directly associated with him because he'd never, as I say, never gotten around to using it. And Icaro used it with great freedom and great inventiveness. And he even, in this piece, started cutting into it and uh, changing it. Uh, he must have had someone come and do the cutting because uh, domestic or studio-sized plasma cutters were not available until the 80s. Uh, that's when he got his first one. Otherwise, things had to be sent out to be sheared. So there are many layers of association here and, and disassociation. Most of the work is low-lying. Most of the work is relatively intimate in size. But then you have this, which is uh, as though he's going, OK, I can make a big vertical sculpture. I'm not going to have the burnished surface. It's not going to remind anybody of a cubi. It's going to be linear. It's going to be open. And it's clearly caro and at a scale. Um, which they're never uh, monumental. They are, they are always within a kind of human scale, even if they're very large. This is about as big as they get at that point. Until 1980, when he's invited to do a very, very large piece for uh, the equivalent of a community college in London. And the building is red brick. Um, unfortunately, there's no color photograph. It, Caro, when he saw the space, said it needed something light. It needed something light reflective. It needed something that would definitely contrast with the red brick background. And this piece was made in stainless steel. This was the first stainless that he'd ordered and had bent specially and made to his specifications. He wasn't using someone else's material. Well, the piece um, was a resounding failure. The students said they want, needed computers. They didn't need sculpture. And the, um, as far as I know, only looking at it from, from photographs, it was an exciting piece. Uh, but it got moved, and it got moved and um, installed badly so that it was up in the air, and uh, Caro said it was site-specific, and if they weren't going to install it properly, he wanted it back. So he got it back. I'll tell you more about that later. But he also, in the 80s, was starting to have opportunities to use other kinds of stainless steel. Um, he did a workshop in Germany with young sculptors and discovered that there was a place that had scrap stainless steel. And it was the kind of scrap stainless steel that someone who was interested in stainless steel could only fantasize about. You know those big, shiny, beautiful milk trucks? That's the kind of stuff it was. So he had all these amazing pieces. And he worked like a demon the whole time that he was there. And of course, by this time, it's the 80s. You can cut the stuff as well in your studio. Uh, so he made, I think, about 10 pieces, uh, relatively, you know, again, human size, big human size. And that became um, another group of works that were uh, starting to deal with volume in a way that was relatively new for him. With no inhibition of re replicating Smith's volumes, he was able to explore something on his own. And at this point, you get a lot of very large sculptures, um, which are probably going to be exhibited outdoors, even though Caro didn't really like his work outdoors. He liked having something coherent, something orderly, um, rather than untrammeled nature. <clears throat> 
Uh, this piece uh, we actually installed for a while in the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, Cathedral in the Cathedral, where it looked very good. But you can see this it's very, very different from the linear work that I first showed you. Uh, these are, this suggests entrance, it suggests enclosure, it even suggests habitation. And then there are pieces like this um, where he was actually fantasizing about making sculpture that could be inhabited. Uh, then he decided that was not a good idea because there were too many things you had to worry about like handrails and floors that were at a, an angle that you could walk on. Um, and his good friend Frank Stella at the same time was making these preposterous things that uh, were completely uninhabitable and, and didn't care, uh, although he claimed they should be inhabited. So they were constantly having arguments about this. But this is, this is the way it got resolved, this kind of metaphorical habitation. And as I say, there are many sculptures that become uh, surrogate habitations or surrogate enclosures where you, you imagine an interior you can't see in uh, or in other cases uh, you walk through them. But larger scale was starting to interest him very much. I told you about his making all these large stainless steel pieces in Germany. Well, there were a couple he wasn't happy with, and they went back to the studio, and they got cannibalized, and they turned into this, which is a masterpiece. And uh, you don't get any sense of the heroic scale of it. This is as, as big as Caro gets. And the uh, authority with which he's deploying these great big planes very economically and very expressively is uh, the result of someone who's been working in this material for 20 odd years and is convinced he knows what he can do with it. He returned to stainless again in the last series he made. Remember I said he got London West back? Well, there are chunks of London West in here, uh, there are chunks of London West and other things I'm going to show you. It's the waste not, want not principle. And he also liked the idea of having to react against something, uh, that there was something that he had to uh, play with. The perspex in here is something he became interested in. As I said, he was, as I told you, after making all these sculptures that were about enclosure and opacity and hiding the interior, he became interested in a challenge that he set for himself. Can you make a sculpture that's all exterior, that you can see into? He'd flirted with that with the expanded metal mesh. There are pieces that have vertical planes of, of mesh that you see through, then you don't see through. But this was using really transparent materials. The very odd thing about this is that it all had to be preconceived. You couldn't just you know, have an enormous sheet of perspex and cut it and see if you liked it and then fiddle with it. The shapes had to be determined in cardboard or in um, plywood. And he had this sort of necklace of perspex samples that he would have hanging around him. It nearly drove him crazy. He hated the idea of the preconception. He said, you, you figure it out, then you wait and wait for it to come, and then it's wrong. So you start over. But he was so intrigued with the idea of the transparency that he persisted. He had started making some works with glass, and he very quickly decided that glass remained glass no matter what you did with it. It always looked like a sheet of glass or a glass object. Uh, Perspex didn't have those associations. But even there, while he was interested in the transparency, here he's painting it so in parts so that you see through parts of it, you don't see through parts of it. And something he liked very much is the way the edges of uh, Perspex plexiglass uh, catches light and creates this drawing with light 
which I'm afraid you don't see very well in this. In fact, you barely see that little outline of the curve. Uh, but that is talking to the actual curves of the steel as you move around the sculpture. And that play of light was something that interested him very much. Those bits are in there. And they're in here somewhere. Uh, you know, if you have all this expensive stainless steel, you're not going to let it go to waste. Um, here, he is really flirting with transparency. As you move around this sculpture, you're not quite sure what you're seeing and what you're not seeing. Uh, this last series was uh, dealing with the visual rather than the physical in a, a very fascinating way. And one of the very last pieces, the one I first showed you, Blue Moon, in which he's literally enclosing with the transparency. The uh, center, uh, the disc is painted, the rest is not painted. And the light reflective qualities of the stainless are clearly very, very important uh, to these sculptures. He completed about a dozen of these. Um, don't know where they would have gone after that, but it was quite an extraordinary group of work. It allowed him to get color back into the sculpture in a different way than he had when he was painting the steel. Although he, he had used paint on and off in between, um, it allowed him to exploit the light, as I say, the light reflector po uh, qualities of the stainless and to play with other kinds of light in a very painterly way, uh, which is not what you expect of a sculptor. On the other hand, you know, there's such a thing as late style, which is not granted to all artists. You have to live a long time to start with, and you also have to be very good at what you're doing and willing to experiment. Uh, Matisse had a late style, Titian had a late style, Rembrandt had a late style, and I would argue that this is Caro's late style, where he's adding light to his vocabulary, not just physical objects. I talked about les legacy. What happened to what, any of the stainless steel that was left in Nolan's studio from David Smith's original stockpile? What, was, what happened to Caro's stainless well, it got passed on. Most of it went to an Irish sculptor named John Gibbons, who lives in London and was very friendly with Noland and Caro. And that steel has new life um, in a way that owes nothing to any of these artists. Um, it's going to probably continue if John Gibbons doesn't use it all up, although the rate he's going, he probably will. But this material being passed from artist to artist um, is sort of taking on its own life. And because of its, pro its properties is uh, influencing the way the artists are working on it. Uh, so I guess the next lecture I'm going to have to give is John Gibbons and what happened to the stainless steel. <laughs> but this is the end of Caro. And uh, he's certainly uh, left us with a very exciting legacy. Thank you.